Before we can understand the basics of functions and their graphs, we need to uh, step back to a relation. A relation is a set of ordered pairs. So remember ordered pairs are usually, they don't have to be an X and a Y, but an ordered pair is, is usually an X and a Y value. That X and Y value corresponds to some point on a graph. Alright, so if we have a set of those, that's called a relation. So for example, say I had the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 7, 9, 3. It's just a collection or a set of ordered pairs. Okay? And those numbers really could correspond to anything. You know, they may be maybe for every hour you put in at the gym you lose two pounds or you know just anything it could be anything but usually those values can be graphed somehow um, like say with an X and a Y alright if we just look at the very first value of each ordered pair that corresponds to the X right and the set of all X values is called the domain that is the set of all X values or input values So we don't have to use the variable x but the domain is just whatever I can take and plug into my equation all right all of the y values call the range or the set of all y values or output values so what do I get when I've plugged in some x value what do I get out as my answer? That's basically what the range is, is a set of answers that you can get out from plugging different x values in. The range is a set of all y values or output values. Answers, usually. That's what we think about that like. After I plug something in, what do I get out of my equation? So like... I said these these ordered pairs could be anything. Maybe this is like one hour spent in the gym and I lose two pounds, which I wish it was like that, but it's not really like that. Um, but the one hour that would be me putting into the gym, and then you know whatever I do in the gym for an hour, then what is my output? I get out that I lost two pounds. So input output and the gym you can think about as like the equation where everything else is happening probably be more like 0.2 pounds but uh that's all right too all right so that's what a relation is and that's how you would find the domain and range of a relation 
Okay, so I'm going to write down the domain and the range for this relation here. The domain, and I'll just capitalize, just say a capital D, is equal to, now let's list all the numbers. 1, 3, 2, and 9. You can really put it in any order you want. It would probably make more sense to put it in like smallest to greatest, but I just wrote them down in the order they were in. So that's how I'd write the domain. The range, that's all the y values. 2, 4, 7, and 3. So if you ever have to list all the domain values, that's just all the x values. You have to list the range values, that's all the y values. If, if I would have had say 1, 3, 3, and 9 instead of 1, 3, 2, if they're the same number, you don't have to list it twice. So yes, you have to list it in different sets if it's in different sets. But again, if you repeat one, don't list it twice, just list it once. All right. Now, if you can take a relation and figure out the domain and range of that relation, then we can do something called a mapping. The way that you do a mapping, the easiest way to do a mapping, is to take one column and list your domain. So one, three, two, nine. Make another column and list your range. Two, four, seven, three. And now look back at your ordered pairs. I plug in a one, I get out a two. So that means that 1 goes to 2. So the way you do a mapping, you can draw an arrow from 1 to the 2. 1 goes to 2 from this ordered pair here. 3 goes to 4. 2 goes to 7. 9 goes to 3. That is a mapping. We use a mapping to tell us if the relation is a function. Okay? So a relation can be a function if each element of the domain goes to exactly one element of the range. Alright? So what I don't want is I don't want my domain go into two different numbers. Like I don't want, want one going to two and one going to four. It's okay if the different domain values go to the same number. We just don't want one value to go to two different numbers. Alright, so if each value of the domain goes to exactly one value of the range, then the relation represents a function. If it does not, you know, if one of the x values goes to two different y values, then it's not a function. All right. Here's the official definition from the book of a function. A function is a correspondence from a first set called the domain to a second set called the range.
such that each element in the domain corresponds to exactly one element in the range. All right, so I know that's a little technical, but basically what it is, one X or each X value goes to one Y value. That's all that says. If one of your X's goes to two different Y's, it's not a function. Okay, so let's look at a relation and see if we can figure out is the relation a function and the way that we're going to do that is by doing a mapping okay so let's say that I had this relation 1 2 3 4 5 6 5 8 Alright, so what I want to do is I want to do a mapping real quick. So list the domain values. That's the x values. So 1, 3, 5, and 5 again. So we don't write it twice. List the range values. 2, 4, 6, 8. Now let's do the mapping really quick. So look at the first ordered pair. 1 goes to 2. So 1 goes to 2. 3 goes to 4. 5 goes to 6. Then 5 goes to 8. Since one of our x values goes to two different y values, or in technical terms, one element of the domain goes to two elements of the range, that is not a function. So usually something like the question would be, is the relation a function? No, it is not a function. Okay, let's look at another example. Say I had this. One goes to two, three goes to four, five, six, and eight, five. Or I said six, I said five, six, I meant six, five, and eight, five. All right, so real quick, let's do a mapping. So one, three, six, eight, that's our domain, our range is two, four, five, five, okay, so, let's do the mapping, look at the ordered pair, one, two, so one goes to two, three, four, three goes to four, Six five, six goes to five. Eight five, eight goes to five. So it's okay that these two elements go to the same element here. You can have different x's go to the same y. That's okay. But we don't want to have, like the previous problem, we don't want one x going to two y's. 
So is this a function? Yes. That is a function. It's just that 1x, when you plug in one number, you don't want to get out but one number. If you plug one number in and you get out two different answers, then it's not a function. If you plug in one number and you get out one number, it is a function. Okay. Um, for example, here's another example. Let's look at some equations. The equations, functions, or not functions. There's a couple of ways to tell if an equation represents a function. Remember what I said. If you plug in 1x, do you get out 2y's? So when plugging in one answer, do you get out two answers? The way you can tell that for an equation without having a relation. Let's say that I had x squared plus y equals 16. And I want to know, does this represent a function? The way that I can tell is solve for y because most equations that we look at are y equals. At least they can be put in that form. So to get y by itself, I need to move the x squared over. So I have y equals 16 minus x squared. Now, when I plug in something for x, do I get out two answers for y? So when I plug in a 1, 16 minus 1 squared, or 16 minus 1 is 15. So plugging in one value gives me one value out. So does this equation represent a function? Yes. Plugging in one number gives me out one number. So the equation is a function. You may be sitting there racking your brain thinking, when can I plug in one number and get out two numbers? Or get out two answers? Let's say I have x squared plus y squared equals 4. If I solve this for y, I need to first move the x squared over. So I have y squared equals 4 minus x squared. Now take the square root of both sides to solve for y. And what do we have to do when we take the square root? Put a what? Plus or minus, right? So if I plugged in, say I plugged in a 1 right here for my x. I will get the square root of 3. I get plus or minus the square root of 3, right? Is that one answer or two answers? Two answers. So plugging in 1x gives me two different y answers. So that is, the equation is not a function. All right. So basically, if you have an equation and you want to know is it a function, solve for y. If you have a plus or minus in your equation when you solve for y, it's not a function. If you don't have a plus or minus and you'll only get out one answer, it is a function. Again, solve for y. If you have a plus or minus, it's not a function. If you don't have a plus or minus, it is a function.
Remember, x is domain, y is range. Now, whenever I first started going over a function, you know, right before that I went over range and domain, and I said you want to think about the range like it's the output and the domain like it's the input. Okay, and so sometimes we can visualize that a little bit better um, if we think of a function as a function machine. Okay, so you know this right here, all this in here, all the inside, that's the function. Here's the input, you plug in some number, you know, maybe I put I don't know, maybe I put in a, a bunch of uh, clothes here, and then this machine does something to it, and then I get out some clothes here. Now, if it were my clothes, hopefully I'd get the same ones out that I put in, but I don't know. Maybe this machine chops clothes up and spits out, you know, for every shirt I put in, it gives me out 10 pieces. Uh, but you can think about a function like like it's a machine. It does something to the number you plug in and then whatever you get out That's the range you plug in domain numbers you get out range numbers Okay um, We have a special way of writing a function Let's say that I had the equation y equals x plus 1. Does this equation represent a function? When I plug in something for x, when I plug in a number for x, do I get out one number for y? Yes. When I plug in, say, a 0, I get out a 1. So it is a function. Now, if you know it's a function, it can be written using function notation. All right, and function notation just means that instead of y, we can write f of x. And that's the way that that is read, f of x. So I can represent this equation by saying f of x equals x plus 1. Okay. Now this doesn't mean f times x. Again, this is f of x. And f of x is the same thing as y. So you may be thinking, why would we even use this function notation? Well, if we have some function, or some, it's some equation, some function that we're dealing with, um, it's easy to evaluate different numbers in our function using function notation. For example, let's say that this was my function. What does it do? Well, let's say that for every minute that I spend doing homework, my average in this class is going to go up by those minutes plus one. Let's just pretend. So what if I want to know how many points my average will go up if I spend 10 minutes on homework? then one way of writing that is to say f of 10. f of 10 means plug a 10 in for your x. So 10 plus 1. So f of 10 equals 11. 
let's say that the next person wanted to spend 30 minutes on homework. So f of 30 would mean take this original equation up here, take your function, and plug in a 30 for the x. So 30 plus 1, or 31. So n function notation is a way that we can write an equation if we know it's a function in a way that is very convenient for plugging in numbers. All right, so let's say that I had the function, let me find one, make one up. Let's say that I had f of x equals x squared plus 3x plus 5. And I wanted to find f of 2 and f of negative 2. So I'm going to do these two problems separately. So f of 2, that means take a 2 and plug in for every x in your original function. So f is right here. That's my function. This is x squared. So when I plug in a 2, I have 2 squared plus 3 times 2 plus 5. So everywhere that I have an x, I plugged in a 2. And then I can't forget the plus 5. It just goes on the end. All right, so that's going to be 2 squared is 4 plus 6 plus 5. Or f of 2 equals what? 15. 4 plus 6 is 10 plus 5 is 15 f of 2 is equal to 15 for this function here. Let's see what f of negative 2 is equal to. So negative 2 squared plus 3 times negative 2 plus 5. So negative 2 squared is negative 2 times negative 2. That's positive 4. 3 times negative 2, that's negative 6, and plus 5. All right, 4 minus 6 is what? Negative 2 plus 5. Negative 2 plus 5 is 3. So f of negative 2 is equal to 3. You could also use function notation to evaluate something like this. What if for that same function I wanted to find f of x minus 5? What that means is everywhere that I have an x, I want to plug in an x minus 5. So look back up here at your function. So that's going to be x minus 5 squared plus 3 times x minus 5 plus 5. All right, so x minus 5 squared means x minus 5 times x minus 5. So I might have to fool that out. And I might have to distribute the 3 to the next term. So that's 3x minus 15. And then I have plus 5. All right, so that's going to be x times x is x squared. x times negative 5 is negative 5x. Negative 5 times x is negative 5x. Negative 5 times negative 5 is positive 25. Plus 3x minus 15 plus 5. 
Now that I have this thing worked out, I'm going to combine like terms. So x squared, then I have minus 5x minus 5x plus 3x. So that's going to be minus 7x and plus 25 minus 15 plus 5. So that's 30 minus 15. 30 minus 15 is 15. So plus 15. Sorry about that. Getting you dizzy yet? Let's plug one more thing in just to make sure we have the hang of that. Let's find f of negative x. Same function here. So f of negative x, that's going to be negative x squared plus 3 times negative x plus 5. Alright, negative x squared, that's negative x times negative x. That's x squared plus 3 times negative x. That's negative 3x plus 5. Alright, so I still get an equation or I still get, I get some other function, and that's okay. That's just what f of negative x would be equal to. All right, you try this one real quick. Let's say that f of x was equal to x squared minus 2x plus 7. I want you to find f of negative 5. f of x plus 4. And f of negative x. Take a few minutes and work those three out. So let's see if I can work these out. Hopefully I can. First I'm going to plug in a negative 5. Now be careful when you plug in negative numbers. Remember to always put them in parentheses. That way it won't mess anything up. So it's going to be 25 when you square a negative 5. Then look I have negative 2 times negative 5. That's plus 10 plus 7. So that's 35 plus 7 or 42. Right, so hopefully you got 42. I'm going to do this, this one to the right and then I'll do the last one. Um, let's plug in a negative x for every x. So I'm definitely going to put that in parentheses. Negative x squared minus 2 times negative x plus 7. All right, so that's going to be negative x squared is x squared. And then negative 2 times negative x, that's a positive 2x, and then plus 7. All right, so x squared plus 2x plus 7 is what x of negative x is equal to. All right, and then this one will take just a little bit longer, but I want to plug in an x plus 4. So that's going to be x plus 4 squared minus 2 times x plus 4 plus 7. All right, so to square that, remember, what do I have to do? have to foil it out. So after you do several thousand of these like I have, you can get to the point where you can foil it out in your head. 
All right, got a long way to go before you can get there though. X times X is X squared. X times four is four X. Four times X is four X. So that's four X and four X is eight X. Plus four times four is 16. So I know I did that kind of fast in my head, but I promise you, if you practice long enough, you'll be able to do that. Then you have minus two X minus eight plus seven. All right, so I have X squared I put the x, two x terms together I have left, that's going to be plus 6x. Then I have three constants. Positive 16 and negative 8, that's negative, that's positive 8. And then positive 8 and 7 is 15. So that's plus 15. So the x squared plus 6x plus 15. So let's say that we want to graph a function. All right, let's look at the function f of x equals 3x minus 3. All right, if I want to graph that function, by plotting points, then what I do is I make a table. Some people call this a t-chart. Usually I put x and y, but since I have f of x instead of, instead of y, I'm going to put f, uh, x and f of x. But remember, f of x is the same thing as y. Now when plotting a graph using points, I would say at least use five points. I usually use about six or seven even on an easy graph like this. The more complicated the graph is, the more points you want to plug in. I'm going to just plug in five here. Always choose a couple negative points if you can. Zero and a couple positive points. All right, And you need to have a basic idea of what the graph needs to look like so that you know that if you're on the right track. And if you graph a function whose highest power is x to the first, then it is a linear equation and the graph that we get should be a straight line. If we don't get a straight line, then we mess the graph up. Okay? So, I'm going to plug in these values that means I'm going to find f of negative 2, f of negative 1, f of 0, f of 1, and f of 2. All right, and I'm going to work each one of those out, and then I'm going to plug the number in the table by its corresponding x value. So f of negative 2 would be 3 times negative 2 minus 3. So that's negative 6 minus 3 or negative 9. f of negative 1 is 3 times negative 1 minus 3. So that's going to be negative 3 minus 3. That's negative 6. f of 0, if you plug a 0 in, this term goes away. So you have 0 minus 3. That's negative 3. f of 1. That's 3 times 1 minus 3. 3 minus 3. That's 0. f of 2. 3 times 2 minus 3. Or 6 minus 3. Which is still 3. Or which is 3. All right, so now go back to your table. Each one of these now, each one of these sets is an ordered pair. Negative two, negative nine. Negative one, negative six. Zero, negative three. One, zero. Two, three. Make sure that you put enough 
places on your graph whenever you construct your graph. Alright, so I'm going to put 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 places on my X. Now on the Y, since I need to go up to, go down to negative 9, I'm going to put 10 up and 10 down. So I'm going to change my scale just a little bit on my Y. I don't think I'll have enough room if I don't. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I may be a little off with my scale, but I'm pretty close. Close enough. So let's see if I am. We know this should be a straight line. The way that you plot points, you start at the middle, you look at the ordered pair, the first number tells you how many to go right or left. If it's positive, go right. If it's negative, go left. So we're going to go left 2 because it's a negative 2. The second number tells me to go up or down. If it's a positive number, you go up. If it's a negative number, you go down. So I'm going to go down 9 since it's negative 9. So I need to put a point right here on my graph. All right. Then, negative, go back to the middle and start over. Negative 1, negative 6. It's there. 0, 3. There. I mean 0, negative 3. 1, 0. 2, 3. All right, now connect the dots. And you can see it's basically a straight line. I may have been off just a little bit. But that's how we would graph that function. I'm sure you've done that a thousand times. But I just want to make sure you remember how to do it by plotting points. The more complicated the function, the more points that you want to put in. For example, if this was a quadratic, meaning x squared was the highest power, I'd probably at least do seven or eight numbers because it needs to be U-shaped because it's quadratic. And so if my graph isn't U-shaped, I'm not plugging in enough numbers. All right. If we already have a graph, so let's say that I had this graph. We have something called the vertical line test that will tell you does the graph represent a function. And the way that the vertical line test works, if you were to draw a vertical line, vertical is up and down. So if you draw a vertical line on the graph, and if that line touches your graph, that would be the red part here, if it touches the graph once, it's a function. If a vertical line touches the graph twice, it's not a function. Now, I'm not, you don't consider the x-axis and y-axis. You don't worry about those. It's just this, just the, the line. Does my vertical line touch it once or more than once? It only touches it once. So this is a function. All right, let's look at another. Let's say this was my graph. If you can draw a vertical line anywhere, and it touches more than once. See this one touches here and touches here. So that touches the graph twice. This is not a function because it touches twice. A vertical line touches my graph twice. If a vertical line touches once, it's a function. If it touches more than once, it's not a function.